sorry, Bill, but I'm leaving. And nothing you say can stop me. Do you hear me? Nothing. Just a nice touch. That's the teaser trailer for the movie I'm going to be reviewing today. Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. <laughs> and, yep, the creepy, the cookie, mysterious, and ooky, the all together ooky, the Addis family. <laughs> yeah, this is the double feature two movie collection that I just picked up recently on Blu ray as a birthday gift, as I just show you in my previous video. And I was so glad to get this because I've been waiting this long to finally get a Blu-ray release. I know the first one got released first before we waited for the second one. And the main reason was because of the then upcoming uh, animated film of the same title. That's based on the popular cartoon strip by Charles Adams uh, for The New Yorker. And that led to a TV series in the 60s. And eventually we had these films. And then we also had the animated series. Uh, and then we also had, of course, uh, <laughs> the direct-to-video movie that led to the TV series on Fox Family Channel, which is now Freeform and, and all. I already explained everything. Um, so unfortunately, this set has no features other than just the two trailers that's on the first movie. And I think that's a shame because I wish Paramount definitely had did so much justice to it. Like they could have put in some interviews, music videos, the teaser trailer that they should have included, and a whole lot more. Same goes with the sequel, too. Yeah. Because it makes the whole thing even better. But nevertheless, the transfer themselves um, definitely looks better than the previous uh, DVD releases that we had. That's the Nox right at the park, too. <laughs> so I love that. And I know the cover art looks um, a lot different from the original movie posters, as you saw on. Um, the DVD releases and VHS, Laserdisc and all. Um, but I'm I'm okay with it. I mean, yeah, this one kind of gives it a a gothic, um, eerie feel to it, and you know that's in blue and it has a moon and, and you see the the grave. And then right here you just see uh, <laughs> once again the graves and you can see their house, you know, the mansion and all the rest. And of course, they even have the baby here joining in. So, so that's nice. Um, yeah, you can see the back. Take out the slip cover. Um, basically the same. Even tells you exactly the critical quotes and information. And <laughs> there you go. To this set. I do have the DVD that's also a double feature, but it's on a just a disc only. But it's nice. I figure I'm just going to show you the Blu ray instead. Um, anyway, now I'm going to start with the review of The Adams Family. Now, as you may know, yes, this was a treble production from Orion Pictures. Uh, in fact, originally Tim Burton was going to direct that, but. He dropped out. So Barry Seinfeld, longtime cinematographer for many films, including the Corn Brothers films of Blood Simple and Raising Arizona, plus the movie Three O'Clock High. You know, he's always known for doing all these dolly shots that are so incredible, zoom ins, quick cuts, editing and all, fast pace, that kind of style. This will be his first directorial debut. 
But unfortunately, you know, he felt very stressful having to direct this entire film because the way things were going. Um, I mean, he was very nervous since this was the first time, um, since he never did it before. Then um, it also led to health problems from two people. Yeah, one was Raw Julia, which apparently, yeah, in, in his early stage, you know, he was having some health problems yeah, long before he, he was getting ready to have cancer. Sadly, I know. But from what I heard, because I read some information online, doing researching, was that um, he had a blood vessel that went straight into his eye and it bled him to death. So apparently um, he was he was taking the rest for, for a while and you know, trying to recover from that. So they had to bring in some medical supplies to help him. Even uh, Sonnefels, his wife uh, became ill you know, during the set. Um, they had a lot of issues too. They even had to do some rewrites uh, from writers, um, from the original writers of Caroline Thompson and Larry Wilson. So they brought in Paul uh, Rutnick to join because the way things were going. Yeah. Well, of course, even with Orion's uh, financial problems, they gave it to Paramount, so hoping that they will save the day. They were also worried because they were afraid this was going to be another financial flop. But, <laughs> luckily for them, it turned out to be a surprising hit. I mean, they were afraid that, you know, Hook was going to beat them up. <laughs> you know, which is the Robin Williams film that's based on the Peter Pan story that's directed by Steven Spielberg. Yeah. So now, um, apparently this fared a lot better than that. And rightly so. And I saw the movie in theaters uh, with my cousin Opa joining in with my brother Jason. And we actually saw this, believe it or not, at the historic Alex Theater in Glendale, California, which at the time was a movie theater, which was Man Feeders, you know, operated by them. Which Man Feeders is no longer around. Yeah, it was a feeder chain that owns the the Man's Chinese Feeder, among many other feeders that they joined. In fact, it's funny because we actually had the Multiplex Feeder that same year. Uh, we were going to go see it over there, actually, which was the same theater we got to see other films, too. Even Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. <laughs> but uh, they were also playing it at the Alex Theater because I guess you know, it got sold out for a while. <laughs> but that was the case. Yeah. So yeah, they had to book it um, before the Alex Theater was going to be closed down sometime in 1992. Yeah, I think the last film was Wayne's World, and then they later were planning on turning this into a, a, a live performance arts and and uh, other other stuff that they will play at, at the theater. And to this day, you know, this still remains as one of the most uh, famous theaters of them all, this side of other theaters uh, in California. <laughs> yeah, but. It was amazing having to see that film over there. It really was. It wasn't in THX Sound though. It was in the uh, Dolby Stereo. <laughs> but I probably would have saw it over there. Which I did saw the sequel over there actually, at uh, at the Exchange. So that was the multiplex theater I was talking about. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um, so it did very well at the box office for its 30 million budget. It, it was 25, but it went up to it for Orion. But after giving it to uh, Paramount, um, it became a surprising hit. It only made 191.5 million dollars. Amazing, yeah. Uh, definitely had a kick-ass soundtrack, which unfortunately, yeah, I know, it won a Golden Raspberry Award. For the Addis Family Groove by MC Hammer, <laughs> but I don't give a crap 
I love that song and all the MC Hammer songs at the time, you know, back in the early 90s. You know, they even had Too Legit, To Quit, and all these other ones. Um, yeah, and it had that really uh, awesome music video, too, to go with it. That I wish it was on the Blu-ray. Surprisingly, it was on the VHS tape, though. So that, that was the case. Um, yeah, there's also some other... Um, issues too that uh, came to be was that the producer of the original series uh, David Levy yeah the series was from Filmways that yeah he actually was ready to sue them for um, infringing his property rights to it so because yes they're borrowing elements from his TV series alone which well that's already been settled too because already you know for a success they after the sequel <laughs> I think they already uh, established that that's always the case <laughs> okay so now let's start the review it stars Angelica Houston Raul Julia Christopher Lloyd Christina Ricci Jimmy Workman of course happens to be the older brother of actress Ariel Winter from Modern Family I, I I couldn't believe it myself when I heard about it. Uh, Judith Melinda, which she would later replace, um, which would later be replaced by Carol Kane in the sequel for Grandma Ma Adams. Keep that in mind. Carol uh, Strickland, Christopher Hart, which is definitely his hand, <laughs> so he plays Fing. John Franklin. Elizabeth Wilson, no longer with us. Neither was Raul Julia nor um, Judith Molina. And, and Dan Adea, I know he's been in several movies in his career. He's in films like Dick, um, among others, I could think of. Uh, he was also in the movie uh, Running Scared. Dana Ivory from the color purple, and yeah, he was. Al she was also in the movie Home Alone 2: Lost in New York, as I mentioned before. Paul Benedict, yes, best known for playing Mr. Bentley, the English neighbor in the TV series The Jeffersons. <laughs> I always keep thinking of him as Mr. Bentley every time I see him, <laughs> and he's no longer with us either. Mercedes McNabb. Um, and yes, there's some cameos uh, joining in with Sally Jesse Raphael. Yeah, remember that talk show that was on TV? Yeah, they used to play this on KKL 9 in Los Angeles, which was at this point used to be KHJ, <laughs> of course. Um, speaking of which, yeah, I know they played it by the time this movie came out. The, the TV series had aired a marathon that was hosted by Mark O'Brien. <laughs> From KLOS 95.5, which is a classic rock station. Also, Barry Sonnefeld, not only the director, but he makes a cameo too. <laughs> okay. Um, along with Douglas, Brian Martin, Stephen M. Martin, Allegra Kent, Richard Kowasa, Brian Holland, and Marine Sue Levin and Darlene Levin. Yeah, twins. Okay, it's written by Caroline Thompson, best known for writing scripts for some Tim Burton films such as Edward Scissorhands and The Nightmare Before Christmas. And Larry Wilson, which has been rewritten by Paul Rudnick, who later went on to write the sequel, and it's directed by Barry Sinefeld, longtime cinematographer. The movie began Sid in a grimy, gothic-like mansion that's filled with graveyards. Yeah, all these, uh, all these grave sites here around. You know, of all the family members, but all these uh, tombstones of certain kinds of statuettes. And then you have a gate that acts like a dog. But when you go inside, even drive by, you entered a mansion. It has 
pretty much everything look more fancy but it's also creepy looking and all <laughs> that's where we meet our immortal family the Adamses that's run by Gomez and Morticia the husband and wife played by Raul Julia and Angelica Houston joined by their siblings Wednesday and Pugsley both played by Christina Ricci and Jimmy Workman then we have their uncles and grandmothers Grandmama who's into uh, witchcraft and songs played by Judith uh, Molina and Christopher Lloyd plays Uncle Fester who loves to shoot out all these uh, dynamite and just play all these uh, crazy games and everything yeah that sort of thing and of course we got like the seven feet tall butler named Lurch that's played by Caroline Strickian Carol Strickian and Fane you know the hand <laughs> that moves around that's played by Christopher Hart which is at this rate his own hand using all the visual effects and everything <laughs> yeah so the story takes place where Gomez um, unfortunately had uh, a 25 year absence with his brother Fester because they weren't getting along and Fester wants up in the Bermuda Triangle you know just to you know focus on his entire life you know doing all this other stuff try to relax and just have the experience that he'll he'll never forget Gomez's lawyer Tully Alford who's played by Dan Adea had old money to a loan shark and con artist by the name of Abigail Craven who's played by Elizabeth Wilson which at this rate you know <laughs> Tully and and Gomez were just going around fencing you know doing their own sword play <laughs> Yeah, because he missed, and he was like doing all the flips and all. So that's why they had to pay him enough for that. Anyway, he, he noticed that her adopted son, Gordon, also played by Lloyd, is closely resembled to Fester. So Tolly's plan was to propose Gordon to um, disguise himself as Fester, you know, shave off his head and so that way he can infiltrate the Adams's household to find the hidden bolt somewhere so that way they can keep all their bass riches for their own yeah so at that rate Tully uh, invites uh, his wife uh, Margaret who's played by Dana Ivory to attend at a sans at the Adams's household that's led by Grandmama yeah, it was, I know they started to pull pranks such as having uh, <laughs> her hand taken out, which is at this rate, it was the fiend that was doing that. <laughs> Trying to contact uh, Fester's spirit, and when Gordon arrives, that's where he poses as Fester, while Abigail poses as a German psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Greta Pinder Schloss by telling the family that yes he's been in the Bonita Triangle for so long and Gomez was just so overjoyed to have him back so now they get to relish uh, the memories that they had together as brothers by going inside the family bolts you know through the <laughs> the library you know that's where it, it enters the secret uh, that's where it enters its secret. Yeah, going all the way down into like a, a roller coaster slide type. I mean, that was really cool. We also le learned that um, that both of them were jealous because they were falling in love with uh, two Siamese twins by the name of Flora and Fiona, or more. Yes, and. They basically saw their younger selves. I mean, they also were pulling the, all these sadistic pranks at, at summer camp and all that. And by the way, um, the younger versions were played by Laura Walker along with Valerie. 
real life twins. But the older versions were played by Marine Sue Levin and Darlene Levin, which we'll get to see them, you know, during the Mamushka for the Adams Family clan joining by. Okay. So apparently, you know, as it turns out, I mean Gomez somehow suspected, as opposed to Wednesday, while she was playing with Pugsley on the electric chair, that he was about to electrocute him, and all these other crazy uh, gags and all. I mean, hey, you know, they're kids. They can do anything they want. <laughs> okay. But, yes, Gordon was trying to attempt to get to the bank bolts, but he has to be alert by all these booby traps that's being set by. And then they expected that he might be an imposter, posing as uh, Fester. And that explains why Fester has been forgetting. I mean, forgetting all the, the secret combinations or any of this other stuff that he remembers. I mean, of course, even for Gordon, I mean, as him, he's beginning to suspect on why they've been falling out together for 25 years. And what Gomez does whenever he gets so angry and frustrated, I mean, he just goes to his train model set where he just rides his train and you know, going around into certain different dangerous areas before it suddenly hits and crashes and explodes, that sort of thing. And of course, you do spot the cameo by Barry Sonnefeld, the director. And I thought that was really <laughs> neat because now he's going to end up being crashed in. And it has some nice camera angle shots too. You know, of Moticia, Pugsley, uh, Wednesday, and even Grandmama, and, and, he, and uh, as well as Fester, or which is Gordon, already, you know, taking all these uh, dynamites and hiding inside his uh, coat. Abigail, under uh, Dr. Pinder Sloss, was trying to convince him that his suspicions are due to this replacement. You know, maybe his mentality kind of went through, and that's probably why he couldn't remember anything. In, in that sort of way. Because it led to this vengeance against who crosses them around. And meanwhile, uh, Gordon has been going very closer to the Adams family together, especially, you know, spending around with. Wednesday and Pugsley, you know, playing all these games such as, you know, taking out some dynamites and just blowing up and escaping, you know, reading a book about wounds, scabs, and <laughs> gouts and all. <laughs> that sort of thing. Not to mention um, helping them out on their school play, which this was a, a sword play that they're about to perform. And this is actually one of my favorite scenes was when they were doing that and somehow blood started spraying around the entire audience. <laughs> yeah, even Pugsley's arm came right out and all that blood was, was spraying around. I mean, wow. And Fester didn't want to miss it too. Yeah, it's Gordon because unfortunately him and, and Abigail were starting to come up with some more plans to, to get into. Uh, Gordon, so Abigail was trying to find Gordon but she was trapped inside this vine until, yes, Lurch finally found him. <laughs> found her. <laughs> yeah, that sort of way. Um, yeah, and, and I guess even for the suspicions, though, I mean, yeah, before, you know, Gordon had entered, yeah, he had to lay down on the bed. He was beginning to see something going around, and somehow Finn came and just touches him and all. Then slept with him too. Well, I know. I was getting back to the beginning. Of course, um, the Adams family does live next door to their neighbor, who happens to be uh, Judge George Warmack, who's played by Paul Benedict, who unfortunately was uh, setting up an auction to sell uh, the Dragon Finger Trap, hoping to earn more money, but unfortunately they just sold it back <laughs> and that's always the case well hey you know they they make mistakes so anyway 
by the time um, the party arrives, you know, for the entire family clan, that's when Wednesday suddenly spotted um, Gordon, you know, which is Fester, which Abigail was with him, and they, they were shaving the, his head, so that way, you know, the hair won't grow back, and that's when she found out that, yes, he is an imposter. So now, um, Professor Gordon, of course, had to chase her around everywhere since the party, and then just before he was getting ready for the mamushka, as he had to perform with um, Gomez, you know, throwing knives and all, and sing and dance. Of course, um, Margaret wants up uh, with Cousin It, yep, talks like a chipmunk, just dancing around, even talking about uh, her feelings, you know, having to marry this guy for 20 years of Tully, and he thought maybe she'll be able to move on, and wants up marrying Cousin It instead pretty soon, because that's how that turned out uh, when we get into the sequel. <laughs> and so... The rest of the family tries to find uh, Wednesday as she's been running away. Gomez finally found her. And if that wasn't bad enough, uh, Tolly decided to send in a restraining order and a, a restraining order to um, the Adamses by actually have Judge uh, George uh, shut them down. And that's what happened. So only to be Gordon. Abigail and Tully to stay at their house, kicking them out, and the Adamses wants up, you know, wants up um, checking out at, at a local motel with all this Indian uh, artifacts and stuff. So yeah, I mean now you know things were going pretty desperate because now seeing that both Ab seeing that Abigail Gordon and Tully were trying to find a way to get into the bolt because having to deal with this booby traps and all. They keep blocking all the accesses. So they were so the Adams family alone, I mean they started getting jobs. Morticia was working as a preschool teacher. Um, Gomez was just having trouble finding one. So he eventually stays home just eating snacks, you know, while watching Sally Jesse Raphael. And yeah. Uh, Wednesday and Pugsley, joining in with Fiend, were about to sell toxic lemonade. Uh, Lurch had taken a drink and <laughs> actually blew a flame straight into the Indian uh, statuette. And then next thing you know, you see a Girl Scout joining by. Yeah, this is the same girl who winds up in the sequel. Um, who was about to sell some Girl Scout cookies, Girl Scout cookies uh, to them. And, yeah, there's a joke in the movie where he says, <laughs> I will give you some Girl Scout cookies if I could try out some lemonade. And then Wednesday says, Are these uh, cookies made out of Girl Scouts? And, yeah, she left. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Fane was going around working as a Federal Express uh, man, just, you know, taking out his wagon and just selling all these... Um, packages around, yeah, running around and, you know, f where everyone's at and just selling all these uh, packages uh, by mail so they could ship them. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's all they've been doing. But then, uh, Morticia returns to the Adams home to confront Fester, only to be captured by Abigail and Tudley. And then that's when Fane suddenly spots them and he was ready to go back to the motel to contact uh, Gomez by using a Morse code to find out that Morticia is in danger. So Gomez rushed by to save Morticia, already being strapped in and trapped, and also being threatened with uh, Abigail for the family fortune. Yeah, with a gun. And then next thing you know. Gordon was telling them not to, but Abigail just refuses and just somehow berated him that with the trick, Gordon decided to take out a magical book, which happens to be a hurricane, so that way they can shoot both um, 
Abigail as well as Tully and somehow <laughs> they spin around like a tornado and somehow the thunder and storm actually affected uh, Gordon's memory so eventually we learned that yep Fester was suffering from amnesia so now he got his memory back while Tully and Abigail have flew all the way down into the coffins and buried alive by Wesley and Pugsley. <laughs> yeah, you can see their tombstones under their names. So sometime later in Halloween, yeah, we see all the kids dressing up for trick or treat. You can even see one of the costumes, like the the Captain America and Spider Man costume, and then, <laughs> yep, and Lord somehow scared them off. And they're just getting ready for the party, you know, taking pictures and all. Just are already happy that Fester is back to his normal self. And now they're about to play the game, Wake the Dead, joined by Margaret, <laughs> uh, Cousin Ed and the rest of the other folks. So, they had a great time, only to discover that Morticia has a secret uh, that he, they didn't expect it. She's going to have a child. Yeah. No doubt this was an excellent movie and the perfect adaptation to the comic strip and even the TV series for that matter. The cast was no doubt definitely uh, the right choice. They were perfect, amazing together. I mean, no doubt. I mean, Raw Julia definitely nails it as Gomez the way that John Aston played him. But given the Puerto Rican accents and all, because after all, he, is, he was Puerto Rican. And joining in by Angelica Houston, which I know it was originally going to be chosen by Cher, which that would have been interesting since she played a witch before in The Witches of Eastwick. But since Angelica Houston already got her brilliant performance with uh, The Witches, why not? <laughs> and of course, you know, with films like The Grifters and Enemy. A love story. There you go. Um, Christina Ricci, this was her breakthrough role after her screen debut in Mermaids, also with Cher. That was from Orion Pictures. Um, she did an excellent job, too, as Wesley, uh, as Wednesday, sorry. Jimmy Workman, yep, this was his iconic role to play Pugsley, and rightly so. I know he's retired, but he has done a few work in his career. Uh, Christopher Lloyd definitely nails it as Uncle Fester, and rightly so. I mean, this is his finest performance since uh, Doc uh, Brown, or Doc Emmett Brown in Back to the Future, and it shows. Um, the rest of the cast, I mean, Dana Dea, Elizabeth Wilson, Dana Ivory, uh, Carol Strickan, and all the rest, you know, they did all tremendous jobs, no doubt, they nailed it. I love all the funny gags that they put in, such as when Gomez was just, uh, you know, shooting golf and went straight into neighbor, you know, Judge uh, George Womack, and, yeah, I know, and he has a whole bucket full of uh, golf balls, <laughs> and unfortunately he was the one who was, who had a case against him, too, so they had to move out. Um, and some nice cameo appearances they have in the movie, of course, as I mentioned, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, yeah, and all. Um, and, um, some other funny scenes, like when Pugsley took out the stop sign, and then that's where you hear the car, uh, <laughs> crashing, and there you go. Or even the, when, you know, they were fencing, or even the... The scene where he's actually uh, playing chess with uh, <laughs> with Fiend, you know, or even arm wrestling too. Plus, you know, there's a bit of a nod to the TV series, you know, which is also in, in the cartoon where, you know, he, they speak French. You know, Calamia, mon cher. And Letitia, that's French. And he kisses uh, Letitia's hand, arms and all. Uh, there's also some, like, a lot of macabre uh, humor in there. You know, like, every time they do all this stuff, they just, they know they're doing something wrong, and then, 
Like for example, when Morticia, you know, always um, find out uh, what nights that she use for Wednesday. Well, just so he can play with his brother, then suddenly he just takes out <laughs> a big knife instead of a small one, <laughs> or any other. other. Uh, yeah. So it really was basically an Uncle Fester story. I mean, that's how it turned out to be, even though this is uh, under the fact that he's basically Gordon. But if that was the case, then yeah, maybe the other Fester was just disappeared. But I know that, I guess that led to some questioning about the story. And I know uh, the test audience who saw the the extended uh, Mabushka sequence, I mean, they felt kind of uh, disappointed at first until they had to shorten it up. I don't know why. I mean, I guess I could see why there were some problems lying ahead, but I would have loved to see what the, the different cut would have been. I would have loved to see all the deleted scenes for this movie, but sadly, we'll never will. I mean, because Paramount d does refuse to bother to take it out and put it on their DVDs and Blu-rays. So that's disappointing. Um, yeah, I mean, I know, they always do a lot of sadistic jokes and all this other macabre humor and all that that just, you'll never forget. Definitely has some brilliant direction from Sonnefell. I mean, this was his first time, so that's nice. I know he had a hard time doing it, but he did the best he could, um, seeing this is his first. Um, cinematography was done by Owen uh, Walsenman. I know they had to bring in some other cinematographers to replace so this one works, it almost had the unique style that Sunfell used to do, those zoom-ins and those quick cuts and stuff, but it, it, even in a slower pace as possible. Um, the, and the editing done by Dee Dee Allen, joining by, so amazing. And producer Scott Wooden, who was a 20th Century Fox executive, and he went on to produce other films too, I mean they join in and just try to have everything all set up right here. So, all in all, I mean, plus it was a huge success, so that's how we got it. <laughs> um, so you got to owe it to them because they worked so hard to put this together. I mean, seeing that this was done by the studio that gave us I mean, the original series. Yeah. yeah, it was done at uh, Hollywood Center Studios in Hollywood, for the most part. I mean, the set's design just looks spectacular. It definitely has the feel to it just right. It feels exactly what the adaptation would have been. I mean, it's as gothic-like as it should be. I mean, Tim Burton would have directed this movie. Granted, if he didn't drop out, I mean, it definitely fit well. I mean, for the writing, though, I think they really nailed it as they could. And even though they had to do a lot of rewrites, mostly for Paul Rudnick, because he knows how to actually use the humor, the witty and clever dialogue that they put into it, perfect. Um, and I can see why here. And the movie was so popular, I mean, because it had a wonderful score by Mark uh, Shulman, it definitely brought in the field together, the Eber field, and, and of course the famous theme song, as we all know. Okay. <laughs> And then, of course, we had the pinball game, we had the cereal, Walston's, and we even had the action figures and all. I did try the cereal, by the way. It actually tastes really good with marshmallows, but I know it didn't last. And it's best not to try that cereal because I know you're going to get sick. I mean, it tastes nasty now than it did uh, a long time ago. But, yeah, that's a reminder. But still, um, not bad at all. I, I can understand why, you know, they had hard times doing so, and I know, you know, they've been stressed out, and they've been working so hard, they had to do a lot of rewrites and everything, and they did manage to bring in the MC Hammer song, too, which I don't mind, they even have all the Hammer songs included, so that's cool. I mean, that's just back when I did used to love listening to Hammer. <laughs> yeah. I do wish they had put the music video and all this other special features included, but we never get that, so that's a shame. But all in all, it's an excellent movie, so I keep saying it, but I'll get it right too. 
So that's the Adams Family, and I give the movie two snaps up, or better yet, five stars. <laughs> Might as well, in spite of its flaws in here and there, but that's okay, just tiny bits. Um, I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and stay tuned for my review of Adams Family Values. I know you're going to appreciate that. Bye.